In this session, we're really delighted and honored to have distinguished panelists from Tufts University. Let's hear a round of applause for everybody joining us from Tufts University, please. <laughs> as well as the Community Health and uh, Nutrition CHN, uh, CHN project and the University of Jordan. All of our panelists will explore the programs and evidence around programs aimed at supporting optimal health and nutrition in women both pregnant and lactating their infants and young children. I'm really honored to invite now our moderator, Dr. Buthain Al Khatib, UNICEF. Tfaddali, Doctora. And we'd highly appreciate it if we could uh, conclude by when? By one o'clock, as lunch will be served by then. Thank you. Not much breakfast. Good morning. Still, we are in the morning. We are not afternoon. So uh, now we'll move on our journey and this lovely journey. Our journey now from the situation that you have heard about, you know, uh, the context in Jordan. So now we'll continue the journey. And uh, our sessions now here will uh, highlight and stress on uh, the need to improve the conditions uh, for mothers, infants, and young children in critical uh, context uh, of uh, uh, and also to uh, support the efforts or let's say the interventions needed uh, to uh, reduce the risk of non-communicable diseases. There is a need in supporting improved nutritional uh, practices in women and children and this you know needs to be uh, in this session actually we will explore the programs and evidence around uh, programs aimed at supporting optimal health and nutrition in women pregnant and lactating their infants and young children. Uh, this session will last for, it was supposed to last for 75 minutes, but I was just told, you know, that we need to reduce the time. So each uh, presenter uh, will have 15 minutes to present, then we'll uh, leave 15 minutes at the end for the discussion. Our first <coughs> presenter will be uh, Professor uh, Eileen Kennedy from Tufts University. She will be presenting virtually, and uh, uh, Dr. Eileen uh, is a former dean of the Friedman School. Currently, she's a professor at the school uh, of research interests uh, include uh, assessing the health, nutrition, diet, and food security impacts of policies and programs, and nutrient density and diet diversity and agri agricultural nutrition linkages. She has been a member of the high level of panel of experts on food security and nutrition of the UN Committee on World Food Security and a member of the UN uh, SCN Advisory Group on Nutrition. She founded and was the first executive director of the <coughs> USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. She created the Healthy Eating Index which is used as a single uh, summary measure of diet quality. Professor uh, Eileen Kennedy, the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you so much, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, the only thing that would make my participation uh, better today is if I could provide this presentation in person. Alas, I cannot. Uh, today I'll be talking about nutrition-sensitive approaches for women and infants. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Shabani Ghosh, a key collaborator with me on this research. If I could have the next slide, please. There was a very seminal publication in Lancet, a series on maternal and child health, which really focused attention on what we know about evidence-based approaches, interventions to improve uh, the nutritional status of mothers and children. And in the next slide, we see that in the blue boxes, there were a series of nutrition-specific interventions or approaches which significantly improved uh, nutrition of the thousand days, basically pregnant women and children up to age two. And the, these were ones where we weren't surprised. Examples, breastfeeding promotion, um, uh, micronutrient approaches like supplementation and fortification. But out of this particular Lancet series, if one looks at the other side of this diagram at the green boxes, 
evidence emerged that there were a series of nutrition sensitive programs and approaches that also could lead to improved nutrition in women and children. And I want to emphasize it was not an either or, but the conclusion was in order to meet the globally established goals for nutrition, we needed both a combination of nutrition specific interventions as well as nutrition sensitive. And when I use the term nutrition sensitive, it means policies and programs beyond health, typically agriculture, social welfare, education. Next slide, please. And today I'd like to talk about some evidence we collected, so prospective longitudinal evidence from a project called Empowering New Generations for Improved Nutrition and Economics Engine. The goal of this uh, program and our research was improved diet and nutritional status for pregnant women and children up to age two. It was a longitudinal study from 2011 to 16. And I want to emphasize the engine package included both nutrition specific as well as nutrition sensitive interventions. Next slide, please. And in this presentation, out of our larger study, I want to focus on three areas. One, WASH and women's diversity, diet diversity, and MUAC. Two, agricultural assets and women's diet diversity. And finally, household decision making. Next slide, please. So. What we see here is looking at across, uh, again, I said it was a longitudinal uh, study in pregnant women up to uh, the birth of their child and following the child to one year of age. And what we see here is the mean diet diversity score in women across all the study time points was low. And our standard was a, um, uh, a minimum of a mean of five or more foods in a given day. So we, uh, at each of the study time points, diet diversity was well below five. Next slide, please. We also see that the proportion of women meeting uh, the standard of diet diversity was low. And the highest time point was time point three, slightly over 20% of women met the diet diversity score. And I will emphasize that time point three was at the birth of the child, the study child. And that's not a typical time point because normally a woman gives birth, there's a lot of festivity, uh, a lot of the community bringing food to the household. So it's the only uh, significant time proportion of women meeting uh, diet diversity standards uh, was the highest. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn to WASH, um, the water and sanitation health environment in looking here at low MUAC by health so wash practices in uh, study points, this is in pregnancy, at three and uh, nine months postpartum, we developed an index for wash, which was a composite of water source, uh, sanitation behaviors, behaviors related to um, hand washing and child feeding. And what we see here very dramatically as we go from the lowest level which is a poor wash score up to fair and good uh, and um, uh, the best, V meaning very good, we see that the proportion of women with low MUAC, mid upper arm circumference, low MUAC decreased significantly. Next slide, please. Did in um, the effect of uh, the wash score, then going from poor to very good, on women's diet diversity and MUAC. And here in the third column, we look at whether the uh, diet diversity score was met. And going again from poor wash scores to very good. Uh, and then we see again, a dramatic increase in the proportion of women uh, meeting the diet diversity score going from a low in the poor wash category of 8.8 .8, up to the high, very good uh, wash practices of 21.54. Next slide, please. So the conclusion, again, from a, a very detailed, and this is only part of the, the uh, um, research we're presenting, but what we found was that uh, improved wash practices increased diet diversity in women, that's good, and improved wash practices also decreased low MUAC in women, also good. Now let's go on to our next focus area, please. 
This particular uh, study of pregnant women and their uh, infants up to age one was conducted in rural areas, and we were interested in looking at relationships between various agricultural assets and aspects of women's diet and nutrition. And what we see here uh, in a very large sample of pregnant women across the study time points, that the percentage of uh, women consuming vitamin A rich foods is very low, on average 6.65% consuming any vitamin A rich foods. And then the, the last column there, percent of women consuming any animal source foods and again, quite low with less than a quarter, less than 25% of women consuming any animal source foods. And a particular focus of this engine product, a project was to increase the nutrient density of the diet. And that includes more vitamin A rich foods and more animal source foods. If I could have the next slide, please. And we were interested in the relationship between uh, again, women's diet diversity score, the mean score, and agricultural assets. And here we chose agricultural land, farm equipment, production of food crops, production of non-food crops, and production of livestock. Each of these assets, agricultural assets, was a significant predictor of a women's diet diversity score. So as assets in each of these categories increased, women's diet diversity score increase. Now, some may look at this table and say, well, this just indicates wealthier households do better. Um, and I want to emphasize in this analysis, we controlled for wealth of the household. So something other than income and wealth of the household is driving these findings. Next slide, please. And then we're also just the, the percentage of women uh, meeting the dietary device, uh, diversity score, yes, no, and the same thing. All of these agricultural assets were significant predictors of women uh, meeting the diet diversity standard. Next slide, please. And we, we disaggregated the agricultural assets further. This is a busy slide. And the, the larger papers that uh, discuss all this are listed into each of the slides, which will be shared. But let me go to the third component down there, food crops. And what we see is going from zero food crops to six food crops uh, produced, we see a dramatic increase in percent of women meeting diet diversity. It uh, dramatically increases when six or more food crops are, are developed at the household level. And also interestingly, when we look at non-food crops, as we go from non to two or more food crops, there also is a significant relationship to increase, increasing diet diversity in women. Next slide, please. Uh, proportion of women meeting diet diversity by number of food crops produced. And this is just a different way of reflecting what was in the, the prior slide. And again, dramatic increases as you go along this continuum from zero food crops produced to six. And the food crop categories included those typically produced in this area, cereals, fruit tree, uh, roots, tubers, vegetables, pulses, herbs, and spices. And again, from zero to six uh, crops produced. Next slide, please. The proportion of women uh, meeting the diet diversity score was not heavily influenced by livestock production. So different than what we saw for food crop production and non-food crop production. Next, please. If I could have the next slide, please. So the final focus area, and we found this very interesting because a focus of um, government in their national nutrition strategy was in agricultural farm households, particularly in uh, low-income farm households. There was an emphasis on producing more nutrient-dense crops and those are primarily fruits and vegetables. The thinking there being, if households produce more nutrient-dense crops, they either, having produced them, will eat them, consume them, or sell them, and that'd be an advantage. And so uh, what motivates decisions of households either produce a nutrient-dense crop, consume it, or sell it? Uh, and what we found, again, from uh, the um, uh, study of households in different areas, different regions of the country, an overwhelming uh, finding 
uh, households, the first priority is ensuring food security before they diversify production. And food security for them meant production of the basic staple. So the goal of the Ethiopian government to produce a more diverse crops will only be achieved if first household security, uh, household food security is ensured in the household. Next slide, please. And I put this in because it's not particularly uh, uh, relevant uh, or the data don't come out of Ethiopia, but having been a former senior uh, political uh, appointee in US government, your equivalent of the Ministry of Agriculture, I'm always interested in how we get things done. And we talk about as researchers, science linked to policy, science linked to programs, uh, but somehow oh, that's not that's not enough. And let me give you the example of research I was involved in, a program uh, called Women, Infants, and Children Supplemental Feeding Program, WIC. Uh, and our research, uh, again, in, in pregnant women and uh, children, our research on pregnant women showed that for every dollar spent on the WIC prenatal part of the program, there was $3 of savings in health care costs. And in the discussion about, this is in the late 70s, whether to continue with or terminate it, uh, and it was a serious discussion, uh, the ministries of finance and equivalent were not so much interested in the significant findings that the WIC program increased birth weight decreased birth weight, including very low birth weight, improved gestational age, improved hematological status in women. Uh, but the, the finding that really tipped the balance to continue this program <clears throat> was the one to three ratio. And I mention this because as researchers, it's important that we do rigorous research, science-based research, but there may be a, a different set of communication skills that are needed to convince policy officials, particularly in ministries of finance and treasury, uh, to um, influence policies and programs. And WIC is just one example. I want to thank USAID Ethiopia under Feed the Future for funding this research. And I will emphasize that what we have presented here for Ethiopia, similar research was conducted in Nepal and Ethiopia under Feed the Future by doctors Patrick Webb and Shabani Ghosh, and some similar findings have emerged. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Eileen, for the very informative and applicable approaches that you have presented. We'll move now to our second presenter, Professor Dr. Imam Badran. Uh, Dr. Imam Badran, uh, she's a professor and uh, currently serves as a staff faculty member at the University of Jordan School of Medicine, and she's the director of the neonatal unit at Jordan University Hospital. Professor Badran is an established clinical researcher and has published almost 84 research articles in peer-reviewed journals textbook uh, chapters, as well as having contributed abstracts and presentations at several professional uh, association meetings. Dr. Bedran established pharmaceutical care of newborn services in 2015 at neonatal unit at the Jordan University Hospital as quality improvement project. She established designated baby-friendly hospital initiative at Jordan University Hospital, where she was uh, team leader for the development of the related quality assurance standards. She has collaborated actively with medical students to form medical student uh, research club to enhance their ability to do research publications. Dr. Badran has established neonatal fellowship program at Jordan University Hospital starting July 2018. <coughs> Currently, she is part of several technical and scientific Committee in, committees in several national and international projects to improve infant nutrition uh, and the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in Jordan. Dr. Badran will be uh, presenting now, uh, you know, as part of our journey, because this is the second stop, as I mentioned uh, earlier, she will talk about the nutritional challenges during pregnancy 
and lactation, as well as the implications for mother and child health. Welcome, Dr. Badran. Welcome. It's a nice uh, introduction. Uh, still, it's good morning. So, just orientation. Uh, yes. So, uh, just give me a few. Uh, so, what's before uh, first slide? How to go to the first slide? Well, this is back. Okay. 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 So um, I work at uh, University of Jordan, uh, and in this building, it's the perinatal building, which is uh, f uh, sub sub uh, it was uh, supported by USAID, uh, which has a great impact of uh, lives of newborns and mothers. I work in the second floor of this building. We teach undergraduate. <coughs> medical student, resident, and we have established the perinatal fellowship, accredited fellowship program. And in addition to the service, we are baby-friendly hospital, and and we support nutrition through parental feed, through uh, pharmaceutical care of a newborn. And before disclosure, I want to tell you, while during doing rounds, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with assessing the nutritional situation of very sick newborns. So I hope there is a nutritionist part of healthcare team who helped me, in addition to the pharmacist, to take certain important decisions for these newborns. Uh, I will talk about first two objectives because of the time limitation and some objective three were already discussed. So the first objective, it's what's we known about maternal nutrition issues and how they affect the health of the mothers and child. So uh, maternal and offspring nutrition have, uh, maternal nutrition can affect the outcome of their offspring either through short, short uh, effect or long-term effect. And I will start with being a clinician with this scenario for which this baby is already in, in the neonatal unit. So uh, the mother, uh, sorry, uh, mother is, uh, mom is, her, uh, is uh, 37 year old. She's gravid of sex, para five plus one. She has gestational diabetes on metformin. She has preeclampsia on aldomet. And we were requested to attend her delivery, which was by cesarean section. She has 36 hours preterm prolonged rupture of membrane. And uh, her emergency cesarean was due to a rupture. The baby was preterm 32 weeks. He has intrauterine growth retardation and small for gestational age. He's low birth weight. And the baby was shocked at birth. He was apneic, arrested. And we, ma and we managed already his respiratory uh, problem. And he has grade 2 intraventricular hemorrhage. The pre pregnancy BMI was 40 for this lady. Okay? So, what about the short outcome, reported short outcome? In summary, we know uh, the short outcomes in obese mother are the post-term and pre-term, but as in this mother, the short outcome is the, of obese mother is the gestation diabetes and overweight is the gestation diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes, cesarean delivery, uh, gestational hypertension, PET, and the preeclampsia and premature rupture of membrane as occurred in this lady, okay? And what is the effect of this short outcome on her baby as what happened to our baby? Is, uh, is the baby was risk of admission to an ICU, uh, low APGAR score, uh, uh, and preterm, okay? Now, what about the long-term effect of maternal malnutrition, okay? The first long-term effect of maternal obesity 
I want to talk on the, on the body composition of her children. This, this study was done on, uh, in one city in Brazil, which is a very important city, and the sample size was 4,231. Yeah, I would like to do to have you add the pointer. This is the pointer. Uh, and they follow these kids uh, up to, uh, they follow these kids to, um, to six year, up to the age of six year. And we can't, we, if you notice, the, on the y-axis is the, sorry. On the y-axis, uh, on the y-axis, the pre-pregnancy BMI and the x, in the x-axis, pre-pregnancy BMI and the y-axis is body fat content. And the, uh, in doing linear regression, there is the child obesity in early childhood was associated with maternal pre-pregnancy obesity. So the more is the mother is obese, the more her child is obese. What about the effect of obesity on cardiovascular uh, risk? This is a study from literature, systemic literature review of from between uh, all published articles between 1946 to 2020, and the study show that ma maternal obesity, with their morbid, obesity or overweight is associated with coronary heart disease in childhood and in adults. Okay, very well known uh, presentation. And there are theories, will, uh, if you I don't know the time uh, allowed to explain it, but fetal, exp it, we call it the theory of fetal programming. If the fetus is exposed to high amount of amino acid, high amount of protein, high amount of sugar, it will affect this uh, intrauterine environment, will cause increased inflammatory markers, will cause changes in methylation and epigenetic, we call it, and will cause this cardiovascular uh, burden. Okay, what about consequence of if the mother is obese and overweight, what's the consequence of diabetes in her offspring? Okay, this is a study on 118,000 children in UK. Okay, and uh, they followed children who were born from 1950 to, uh, to 2011. If, and they took this uh, data from the Scottish Care Information Diabetes Registry. And what they found that uh, that if the mom is obese, if and she is overweight or, or overweight, they have their offspring at increased risk of diabetes. Which type of diabetes? It's the type two, okay? Type two. And these association were independent of perinatal social de demographic variants and maternal history of diabetes. Okay. What about effect of obesity on their offspring regarding the, their neurodevelopment and psychiatric disorders? There are a lot of growing evidence that prove that maternal obesity has an effect on the, their offspring neurodevelopment and psychiatric disorders. There is a lot of evidence talking about this. And the mechanism is the intrauterine life, the inflammatory markers from the obesity can affect the fetal brain. Now, for coming back to this lady, I treated her the short outcome, but she's, what I have to tell her about the long-term outcome of her babies. Now it's the time that we, the researchers, we have to talk to the policy makers to counsel, how to counsel this mother about long-term outcome. Shall I tell her that your, there's a risk of neurodevelopment, abnormality, there is a risk of your baby will be obese, he will be diabetes, co diabetic, and he will have cardiovascular risk? There is, okay? What about context of Jordan? 
Jordan is part of the globe. And just to come, uh, just to notice, this is global prevalence of obesity and this is global prevalence of overweight. Obesity is higher in women than men. And this is the case in MENA region. This is female and this is male. And in Jordan, and women in Jordan, 30% in the childbearing age are obese. Okay. So, so the, in, in Jordan, there is a lot of excellent research which help us, just I will highlight these researchers to take strategies. This is excellent review by Dr. Narmin Alawad. I, I know her from her work, but uh, I just knew her today. It will help us to take decisions. And uh, Dr. Rawhiya, I think this is a paper uh, uh, which will help us also to take decisions. There is, decision, uh, there is a paper done by uh, Dr. Uh, I think Dr. Yusuf Khadr and Dr. Rima Tayyam and they follow the food transition between 1965 and 2005, and they found that we have the increase food energy intake, the food, and we have increase in the cereal intake, meat intake, animal intake, and the fruit, and we have decreased consumption of the fruit and vegetables. We are not free, we're eating fruits and vegetables as our uh, uh, families. And there is a lot of challenge. Jordan has uh, uh, seven postgraduate uh, university who has program in nutrition. Okay, these are the universities, but the problem that dietitians are not recognized as member of healthcare team. Uh, as I'm doing around, I need nutritionist with me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think this is the end. Okay, thank you. With many thanks to Dr. Imam Badran who gave us, you know, the, now the clinical uh, evidence from the hospital. We'll move now, you know, to the uh, third uh, presentation. It will be, you know, about how to, uh, the evidence of the programs in the field. Uh, we'll have our presenter, Dr. Doris Young. She's the chief of party, Community Health and Nutrition Project. It's a USAID project. And she's uh, also uh, uh, that the, the project that is implemented by FHI 360. She's an international public health uh, practitioner who brings more than 25 years of experience in managing complex bilateral and centrally funded global bro projects focused on maternal, newborn, and child health, and also nutrition in more than 60 countries in the world across the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. Uh, Dr. Uh, Doris is passionate about advocating and designing health systems to ensure equitable supply and use of customized high-quality nutrition services while linking them with robust social and behavior change strategies. Her focus is to leverage the use of evidence-based research and innovative practices to inform programmatic interventions. The floor is yours, Dr. Doris, to present you know, about the situation or the current program being implemented in June. Thank you, everyone, um, and thank you for the b beautiful introduction. Really appreciate it. I've been, I've been sort of from the moment I walked in this morning. I feel I'm along. I'm, I'm sitting together with my colleagues and with people that are passionate about the same topic I'm passionate about, which is maternal and child health. And a lot of the things that you're going to see in my presentation, uh, you know, I've been hearing things about community. I heard things about the healthcare provider. I heard, for instance, about the facilities. I heard things about 
evidence and research to inform interventions, and I hope that you will see those principles reflected in our program. Uh, just, okay. I'm moving it, it's not moving. I need help. <laughs> Is it this way? Okay. No, but it's, now I need to go back. Bear with me. <laughs> all right, here we go. I think I got it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, the Community Health and Nutrition Project uh, is a six-year program. It's funded by USAID. Uh, the prime on the project is the Family Health International, which is FHI uh, 360. Our strategic partners, we're very proud to have our strategic partner as the Ministry of Health in Jordan, particularly the primary health uh, directorates working together with the Health Awareness and Communication Directorate, the Women and, uh, Women, uh, and Child Health Directorate, as well as the Non-Communicable Diseases Directorate, particularly working with the Nutrition Department. And I'm thrilled to see Ruhiya today, Mahansi Ruhiya with us. Uh, we've, we've, like sort of in the last uh, few months, have been working very closely. And uh, I've also benefited from your presentation, so thank you. And I've also seen Dr. Where is Dr. Han? Okay, sorry, I'm looking over there. <laughs> and I was actually going to ask you in my presentation to talk a little bit about the breastfeeding policy, because that was one thing that I was, uh, I, I was, in, you know, I was really happy to see, and I would like to learn more about. Uh, we have, we're very proud in this project that we have local partners that really lead the implementation of this program. This is a Jordanian program led by local partners working with the Ministry of Health. And our partners are the Healthcare Accreditation Council, uh, the Institute for Family Health, and the Royal Health Awareness Society. And each of those partners really bring very unique experience. Uh, the HCAC brings experience in, uh, recog in recognition and accreditation of facilities. The Institute for Family Health uh, they have a lot of experience in delivering service delivery, but also linking it with community outreach activities. And we have the Royal Health Awareness Society, which is really is very, very good at working at the grassroots level and focusing on nutritional issues, not only with mothers, but also with children and working with school, with school age kids as well. So as you can see, FHI 360 is in good company. Uh, for for the, the main uh, sort of focus of the project is to achieve uh, measurable improvements in six key practices. Uh, for, first is to, fo to focus on the dietary diversity during pregnancy. We wanted, we, you know, a lot of people were talking about the preg you know, pregnancy and nutrition and children and we look at basically we have to focus on nutrition right when the baby is beginning to basically get formed and it's during pregnancy. And when I, I liked what Patrick was said, the best thing is for, for babies is, is basically breastfeeding, and the best thing for babies as well is to have the nutritional diversity that the mothers are basically consuming. Um, and so I agree with you fully. I want to start at the pregnancy, go all the way up. And, uh, and, and then in immediate, immediate breastfeeding, uh, uh, initiation of breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding, the timely introduction of uh, complementary foods, and then uh, after that, the uh, uh, healthy family diet as a whole, and, and then postpartum family planning. And during COVID-19, uh, we were, uh, during COVID-19, we were pulled in to support the Ministry of Health in the national response, focusing on uh, women and children. Ah, sorry. What is our aim in this project? Um, our vision for the project uh, as a whole is, is, is really to increase, to accelerate, and, and have better outcomes for maternal child and family health outcomes in general, with a focus on nutrition. And the way we're doing it is we're having a systematic approach of how we're going to do it, and we base it on a socio-ecological method uh, for change that really focuses, engages, and empowers communities. 
so that they become champions for their own health. We believe that the communities themselves should be the champions and should demand quality services. And then, so this is for us is on the demand side. On the supply side is to actually think about what can the clinical services or the healthcare provider need to be able to meet the demand of the community. And then how do we create the linkages between the two to make sure that we are supporting everyone. So we support the community to empower and engage and become champions and demand quality services. We support the clinical services by strengthening the capacity of the healthcare provider. And then we create linkages between the two so there's a continuous communication and improvement as needs arise. Generating evidence. This is one that I love because everybody talks about evidence today. And we, have, we do believe in that. We believe in data to inform the design of our program. And we looked at uh, available data, starting with an in-depth literature review of all the global evidence. We also looked at uh, research, basically quantitative, qualitative research. We did market analysis. We did gap analysis. We did formative research to look at the different dietary practices. By the way, I know my slides by heart and I can't see them, so I'm gonna be honest. If I'm going through the bullets in different forms, forgive me, you know, in the, in the order, um, because it's for me, it's just a, the monitor doesn't work for me. Um, and so literature reviews, market analysis, gap analysis in facilities, formative research, and I would like to encourage you tomorrow, our uh, senior research and monitoring evaluation specialist, Lana Khoury, will be presenting on the, res on the results of the formative research. So if you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to really come and attend her uh, session tomorrow. And we did some quantitative and qualitative assessments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we continue to monitor and evaluate. And I really wanted to talk a little bit about our partnership with NIL and how excited we are and what a unique model this is for Jordan and for me for the program for community health and nutrition. Um, a lot of people when I today were asking me, how are you different from NIL? Are you the same? What are you doing together? So NIL is actually, they bring a lot of experience, global level experience in research. And what they will be doing, how we're going to be working together with the community health and nutrition is they will be carrying out annual assessments of the activities that we are implementing. And they will be sharing that data with us on an annual basis. We always struggle of when to adjust our approaches, where to focus. And so this is the opportunity we have. World-renowned research team helping us do the surveys, do the assessments, and then we take the data that they produce and we sit together and we modify our design and we look at the implementation on an annual basis. So thank you, Neil, for the opportunity and look for a lot more of us working together. Ah. I'm going to go really quickly about the community. I just wanted to show you sort of how complex the community is. People think it's only the mother, but actually the mother is surrounded by an environment that we need to create that enabling environment to support the mother, whether the, whether the influencers, the people that impact her ability to adapt good practices, live with her in the house which is usually the husband and the family and the mother-in-law. But beyond her immediate, if we zoom out of the house that she's living in, we see a lot of networks. We see a lot of people around her that can support or actually hinder. Just a couple of examples I will take is, uh, for instance, people talked about the marketing of, of uh, breast milk substitute. The private sector can play a negative role that way, but can then also play a positive role with private NGOs such as A Birth and Beyond, and there are others in Jordan that are promoting and creating a social movement to basically push and advocate and support the mother. So I, there's a lot of networks, religious groups, social media, particularly when it comes to the youth, they're really getting a lot of their information uh, from the social media. So when we're talking about the community, we really need to think about all these different networks and how they help the mother basically either adapt the behavior or hinder her from, from adapting the behaviors that we discussed. 
Okay. Um, one of the things that was uh, one of the things that was shown in our formative research is that the mothers really do not, when it comes to breastfeeding, when they have problems with breastfeeding, they do not go to the healthcare provider. They don't get their information from the healthcare provider. And when we ask the healthcare providers, they're very comfortable talking about nutrition, but not talking about challenges or how to help the mother with breastfeeding issues. And so we basically, we wanted to create a, a uh, solution for this issue. And we came up with a lactation, uh, with a lactation counseling, Lactation Counselor Certification Program. This is the first time this program is being implemented in Jordan. Bear with me, guys. Bear with me. Okay. Because this is important. This is the first time that a program of this kind is being introduced in Jordan. Uh, it is basically creating a cadre of lactation counselors that the mother basically can go to if she's having any problems. It, this this uh, course is basically based, I'm, gl I'm very glad to have WHO and UNICEF in the room because a lot of this course, a lot of the material and the content of this course is built on the resources from WHO and UNICEF and they are the lead in this area and we thank you very much. Um, and the, the, we started, we didn't want, you know, I heard the word sustainability mentioned earlier and we wanted to really make sure that this lactation certification program, yes, it's supporting the mother, but we also wanted to have sort of a value giving to it or a motivation incentives given for people to take it on. And uh, so we were able to, working very closely with the Ministry of Health, we were able to secure uh, continuing professional development credit, uh, credits, and those were provided by the nursing council, the medical council, as well as the higher council. And they gave the maximum hours credits. If you take this course, you've, re you've reached your maximum required credits for uh, continuing professional development. Another thing that we're uh, working on, also focusing on the healthcare provider. Okay, it's not me. I'm doing it right. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, we're also bringing in an e-learning course. Uh, uh, this e-learning course is really based on the latest uh, evidence as it relates to infant and young child feeding. We didn't just wanna take it, we just wanna, we wanted to create something that's customized, that fits the Jordanian context. So we brought in some international experts and regional experts. And, uh, and we've basically linked it. It's in Arabic. Uh, one topic, how we modified it, is complementary uh, feeding. We really, the foods that are covered in this area in the course are our foods. We don't talk about peanut butter. <laughs> we, we talk about what we eat. And so it has applica application in Jordan as well as uh, regional application. And uh, really, um, Hansi Rohiyeh has, uh, has helped us quite a bit with this, particularly the complementary uh, uh, component module, so we thank her a lot. Okay. Finally, I'm going to be really quickly uh, say, okay, we worked with the community, we worked with the healthcare provider, now we need model services for this healthcare provider to work in. And that's what we're doing. We're coming up with standards. HCAC, who is known for accrediting healthcare services, will be um, the one responsible for accrediting those clinics. We will train staff, we'll come up with standards, and we will come up with a network of, uh, that's network service, uh, net, a network of service facilities that's able to, okay, there we go, uh, that is able, that's able to, to deliver the services the way we want them deliver in the, uh, and we're talking about maternal, infant, and young child supportive services. Finally, and my, I'm, it's zero, but basically coming back to when I started, community, and then I talked health facilities, the linkages between them, making sure that they're both working together and listening to each other. And that's the only way that the demand can be met by the supply and we can continue to evolve and develop better health services. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Dr. Doris.
Actually, we have savings, you know, and on our time from uh, the first two presenters, we have almost six minutes. So I counted. That's why we are on the safe side, don't worry. So now we move, you know, to the, our last speaker, which is not in last, but not least, okay. We have Dr. Uh, Ghosh Shibani. Uh, she's an associate professor at Tuft University, principal investigator, and also uh, working with Feed the Future Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab. So now we are continuing our journey, you know, with the CHM project. Dr. Shibani is a public health nutritionist and research associate uh, uh, associate Professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy within the Food and Nutrition uh, Policy and Program Division. She's also the Associate Director for the USAID Feed the Future Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab. She has over 20 years of experience, of research experience actually, in the Middle East, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Her research focuses on examining malnutrition in all its forms, formulating and implementing evidence-based interventions, focused achieving optimal growth and development of infants and young children, and nutrition, health, and well-being of pregnant and lactating women. She designs and implements rigorous research with the objective of generating evidence and identification of actions for program and policy uh, recommendation. Now, you know, we are, she is going to present about the research part and the findings of the baseline survey that supports the implementation of the community health nutrition uh, program. This is an evaluation, you know, and uh, to generate more evidence on the situation. And this, you know, is the first step on sustainability of the programs and uh, identification of the proper interventions uh, for the population of Jordan. Dr. Ghosh, you know, the, the floor is yours. to the guys? Yeah. The guys will move? <laughs> you should have told me. I <laughs> Okay, maybe. Ah, success is ours. All right. Yalla. Okay. I know. You know, I think we should all be given like two minutes of time. And Dr. Iman, you need to get more, really. <laughs> No, no, no. So, um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm sorry, I'm the one person that stays between you and the lunch, uh, but I'm hoping to present to you some uh, really interesting findings of the baseline survey um, that we've conducted um, on the Community Health and Nutrition Program. And Doris has really given a very nice sort of background information on how CHN and NIL are interacting and engaging on a very what is very, very critically important um, um, collaboration. So I am back again. Come on, come on, gentlemen. There, okay. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to keep shaking Dr. Anna. <laughs> Someone's gonna move. Um, so I think, I, I think, sorry, oh, back, back. This is like a, it's like a comedy, you know? Um, <laughs> so I think just want to, before I, I mean, I, I'm running out of time here, uh, but I just want to sort of highlight the fact that what Doris was saying, that the, the critical importance of researchers and programmers working together, because we really want to generate evidence on impact and performance of programs so that the program itself can adjust its its actions and activities, but then it's also a way for us to inform future programmatic action, but also policy action. Because anything that is done programmatically has significant implications down, down the road with respect to policy action. Um, and so given all these contexts and all that has been already mentioned by Doris, I think our objective as the NIL is to work closely with CHN to conduct an evaluation to assess 
the impact of the program, but also to assess the program processes and its implementation to identify lessons learned, but also best practices that will allow us to understand how such programs can perform, uh, they perform, and then they can perform in the future. Um, so just to highlight the three components to this evaluation, we have what we may all be very familiar with in this room, which is an impact or an outcome evaluation, which is where we ask the question, did the program achieve its stated outcomes? Doris has outli outlined about six or seven different outcomes, and many of them are basically behavior changes. So the question is, we are going to ask, uh, is did some of these behaviors change, or did, were there actions that occurred that could shift these outcomes? But the second part of this uh, sort of evaluation is understanding whether the program was implemented as it was designed. Uh, and that's part of the process and performance piece. Because sometimes programs, when they are designed, when you come down on the ground, and I think Doris is probably much more experienced on this than I am, is that they have to be tweaked and contextualized. And so the question is, what was done? What needed to be done to contextualize it? What were the facilitators and barriers for that kind of implementation is what the second piece is about. And lastly is the sustainability piece. There's really, really critical and important part is to understand what program elements can be sustained can they be actually, say, incorporated into the healthcare system? Um, can there be some actions that can continue either at the subnational or the national level? So that's essentially, in a nutshell, of what we are trying to do with the CHN um, team with respect to this evaluation. What are the methods? And one of the things that we always run into between research, uh, researchers and programmers is how do we design a study around a program that is evolving, that has to uh, modify itself as, the action, as things change on the ground. We've been very, very fortunate to be able to work with FHI 360 and the uh, CHN team in designing a, a, a study around the program. We're using a cluster randomized approach and a step wedge design, and I'll give a little short explanation of what a step wedge is, um, and where we will be following the, the CHN program in the 21 facilities across the districts in three governorates that they are going to be implementing. Now, the step wedge design essentially allows us to divide these 21 facilities into two different cohort groups, and in one cohort group, the program will be implemented initially, and then the program will then go into the second group. So it, uh, it allows us, it's, it creates two steps, and it allows us to actually basically assess the program without having a control group. So it's basically a, a design that is very well suited for uh, evaluating large-scale programs where you can't actually just have an RCT and have a control group. So in essence, what happens is that the program Facilities that are going to be targeted by the program in the second cohort become the control for the first. So, and I'm looking at the time here, so I'm, no, I'm just at methods. <laughs> So I'm just going to skip quickly over this slide. This was just to highlight how the step wedge uh, process works. Um, and yalla bina. All right, so one of the other things that I also want to mention is that it is a, a while it's a step wedge cluster randomized design, it's a cross-sectional design because we are, uh, our, our target group are uh, basically pregnant and lactating women with their children under two, and they could be non-pregnant women with children under two as well. So we're doing a cross-sectional um, uh, design or, or repeated over time. This is just to show you the different assessments that we will be doing. Today I'm going to be talking about the baseline, but we have, as Doris has mentioned, annual panels that will be conducted, whether quantitative and qualitative, that will allow us to feed back into the evaluation as well as to the, into the program as they are designing their activities. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, these are inclusion, exclusion criteria. I just want to highlight the fact that we want to make sure that any such research undergoes ethical clearance, um, and we have to absolutely have approval from the Ministry of Health, uh, IRB, prior to Tufts University giving us ethical approval. Um, the sample size for the, uh, the entire survey across the four panels is about 3,750 women. And for this particular panel, the baseline that uh, I'm going to be talking about, there was about 1,070 women. This was divided between both pregnant and lactating or non-pregnant women. And I'm just going to skip, skip over to the module, from the modules over to, oh, that, I didn't want to skip that much. 
who's, who's, who's controlling? No. <laughs> All right, baseline survey timeline. I'm just gonna say that we conducted this survey last October in 2021, and most of the data collection was completed through the end of November. Um, and just to give you a, a character, the characteristics, if you look at the last slide, which is the uh, last column, which is the overall, we had about 54% of our sample was pregnant women and about 46% were non-pregnant lactating women with a child under two. We were able to survey uh, women who had their children with them and we had about 53% of the sample were, uh, children with chil were women with children under two years of age. We also, and I, I failed to mention in this whole process, that we did two surveys. One was for pregnant and lactating women who visit these 21 facilities. And we also did a health provider survey um, in those facilities. We were able to survey 70 healthcare providers. And these are individuals who work across from obstetrics down to pediatrics and everything in between where they provide support for women and children within that age group. So we had about 70, uh, 70 healthcare providers, and most of them were women. As you can see, again, I'm gonna highlight the last column, 99%, 69 of the 70 people were women uh, providing services. So let me just start by some of the results uh, for the pregnant and lactating women survey, and then I'm gonna jump into the healthcare provider. First of all, what you are seeing here is breastfeeding practices. Early initiation of breastfeeding was high, and it's very, very much linked close to what we have seen as estimates at the national level. Uh, what you see in the blue bars is if the child was ever breastfed. That is also very high, and that's not, su that's not surprising. We are also aware of the national statistics. Unfortunately, exclusive breastfeeding rates are low in this population, just as they are at the national level. I want to highlight the second graph that you're looking, look at the right side of the screen. And what you see is when the child, when exclusive breastfeeding rates drop, and it's by three to four, two to four months, uh, women are intru introducing either formula or other foods, and again, this is very much tracks the, the national estimates that we are seeing. But what I really wanted to highlight is that very rapid drop that has been occurring in this, uh, in this population. Um, just quickly going over the complementary feeding, this is also very linked to the, the, the exclusive breastfeeding and continued breastfeeding. On the left side of the screen, what you're seeing is the age of introduction to complementary foods, and on the right side, what you're seeing is introduction to infant formula. And irrespective of the governorate and across the entire sample, I want you all to look at the blue and the red bars. And what you see is essentially the age of introduction is, can be anywhere between one month to one to, uh, one, uh, one to five months. So most of these kids are being introduced to complementary foods before six months of age. But what's very clear is that a lot of it is infant formula. So the right side, you see the blue bars is over 40% of the kids are receiving infant formula by one month of age, okay? Again, it tracks the national estimates that have already been presented. Um, with respect to complementary feeding uh, practices after six months of age, what you see here are three different indicators. One is minimum diet diversity, which is in blue, minimum meal frequency, which is in red, and minimal, ac minimum acceptable diet, which is in green. And the minimum acceptable diet is a combination of the number of minimum, the meals that the a child has been provided and the diet diversity. And that is considerably low in this population. Again, this tracks the national estimates that we have, we have seen. We've also looked at what happens to infants who are breastfed versus non-breastfed at the time of this interview, and we see slight changes and differences um, it, with respect to minimum acceptable diet. Every click I have to make, I get 30 seconds, yeah? I'm, tell, I'm telling the MC. 
<laughs> so the diet in women, this was another important one that we found that there is a, a significant number of pregnant and non-pregnant women who do not meet the minimum diet diversity. I think we are looking at a range of around 40 to 50% who meet the diet diversity. What I want to highlight to you all is on the right side is what is it that the women are consuming? What you see is a lot of grains and tubers, and I, I hope this is a flash. Yes, it is. So you see a lot of grains and tubers, and, and then what you don't see is a lot of vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables, eggs, a little bit more meat, fish, and poultry, and a lot more dairy. So there's a little bit of an imbalance with respect to the dietary diversity um, in women, both pregnant and non-pregnant. But what was critical to note here is that the pregnant women had slightly better diet diversity than the non-pregnant women in this, in this population. This is very critically important. One of the things we found, and I'm gonna, again, uh, have you all pay attention to the right side, which is the bar graph. That is the waist circumference in non-pregnant lactating uh, and non-lactating women. And what you find is that over 40% of the women, irrespective of the governorate, had a high waist to hip ratio that is greater than 88 centimeters. The mean was about 86 centimeters. Uh, and on the left side, what you're looking at is a heat map of the percentages of normal weight on overweight and obese. And yes, you find about a third of the population are normal weight, and this is in non-pregnant women in our sample, but you also find significantly high overweight and obesity. Um, I'm gonna skip through this very, very quickly, but there were two things that I really wanted to highlight was, one is not many women had information on the di of di uh, about diet and nutrition in pregnancy and lactation. But if they did have it, if they did have it, they did apply it to their own lifestyle. The second thing is about half, a little over half of the women did receive information on early initiation of breastfeeding, and most of it was coming from faith-based groups, but also from medical doctors. And again, if they receive the information, they will apply that to their own practices. So that's a critical piece to note over here. If they receive the information, they're, they're likely to apply it. The, the issue is, are they receiving the information? Um, okay, and so then this was the same thing with exclusive breastfeeding. Um, that the, about half of them were receiving information on exclusive, uh, exclusive breastfeeding, and most of it was received, they were receiving it from a neighbor or from a relative. Um, and only about 40% had received any information of foods and food groups that they would feed to their, cho uh, their children after six months of age. Um, and you know, uh, about 77% of them had received information on modern co contraceptive methods, but these were primarily from doctors, neighbors, and friends. So this was sort of to highlight the point that Doris was making that it's not just the health facilities, but it is the community, it is the friends, the neighbors, the faith-based groups that are really going to be very critically important sources of information. And I'm over time, I know, sorry, I apologize, but I do wanna make one particular point because there was the healthcare provider knowledge was relatively high. They were, most of them had received some form of in-service training for IYCF. Uh, training on breastfeeding, only about 40% of them had received any training on diets and nutrition. Uh, but they had also received, uh, a small proportion have received training on newborn care services. So that's also critically important to note. Um, and most were aware of the importance of early initiation of breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding. Um, but only 16% of the uh, healthcare providers could identify good signs of positioning a baby for breastfeeding. And I think this is where the whole issue of lactation counseling becomes so, so important. Um, and only 47% of them knew about demand breastfeeding. The, the thing that really, really struck me, this is very important, Dr. Hanan, for you to note, that only 15% of the HCPs in private health facilities were aware of the international code uh, of marketing of breast milk substitutes. The number was much higher in the public facilities, but it's about still about 43%, as you will note on that second last uh, slide. But most of them didn't know how to identify the minimum number of food groups that a child from six to 23 months has to, uh, should eat every day. So these were really, really critical, critical findings. Um, and so again, 
in conclusion, I'd like to say there, ha there is uh, some level of variability in the outcomes that we have seen across the governorates, but they're all, all pretty much tracking the national estimates that we are seeing. But there is a variability in knowledge, training, and capacity of healthcare providers across the governorates, and that's an important finding, I think, Doris, for us to discuss. Um, and really, one of the things that we don't have time to talk about, but we did some analysis on what were the factors that affect in ensured odds of better outcomes. Really, mother's education, the household socioeconomic status was important, but also the geographic location. And lastly, I think I really do want to highlight the fact that the whole issue of the waist to hip ratio and the body mass index is really, really identifying the risk of complications in not just you know, currently for the mother, but for her future pregnancies. And as um, Dr. Iman has pointed out, there is a long-term risk in these women and in their offspring of very early onset of non-communicable diseases. I thank you all for giving me the extra four or five minutes from your lunchtime, and I, I, I do hope um, um, you all have a, a good rest of the day uh, at the symposium. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, sincere thanks to our distinguished uh, presenters, uh, Dr. Uh, Eileen and Dr. Iman and Dr. Uh, Doris and Dr. Uh, Ghosh. Uh, now the floor is open only for one question. That's what I was told, but I have another proposal for all. If you have uh, any other question, you know, we have our presenters with us during lunch or maybe, you know, in the coming day or uh, in the afternoon. It depends. Uh, so you can ask them. So we have only permission to uh, ask one question. No questions? So because we have online, to be fair, we need to be, you know, fair with the online people. We have only one question, and it was addressed to Dr. Iman Badran. Uh, it's uh, the question, what is the optimal body mass index for a woman planning to get pregnant? Is there a specific number within uh, the normal range of body mass index between 18.5 to 24? Okay. So it's uh, the pre-pregnancy BMI, it's the same as uh, Pre-pregnancy BMI is the same as the WHO definition. The normal, we should, should we have the normal uh, uh, classification of normal weight that's between 18. Can you please bring it closer so okay. the translators uh, could hear you better? The ideal Thank pre you. Pre-pregnancy BMI is the, uh, it's what's uh, defined by WHO, is the BMI between 18 and uh, 24.9. 24.9. Exactly. Yeah. This exactly. is the recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Butaina. Thank you, our exceptional uh, speakers, uh, for this great session. And I believe uh, now we need to break for lunch. Um, if you see on your programs, uh, we deliberately put lunch today uh, to be a little bit longer than the other days. So it's going to be something like uh, an hour and a half because we need you as well to visit again the poster room and to see the outstanding researches uh, that are presented there. Just uh, one tip for you, um, the prayers room will be on the M level, mezzanine level. Meeting number one is for ladies meeting number two for gentlemen. So we hope that you would rest and have a great lunch and come energized after lunch because it's a, you will be giving the speakers after lunch a hard time, I mean. <laughs> so please come, come uh, back with energy. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank our dear translators. Uh, you will be with us as well uh, in the afternoon. So bon appétit and see you back, please, at... 2.45. Thank you very much.